This is the Own It Show, where we tell stories of how everyday people made ownership theirs to create extraordinary success. Welcome back to another week of the Own It Show. I'm Justin. And I'm Elise. Welcome to the show. And guys, I hope you're sitting down for this one because this one's going to be in your face. And as you leave, if you're not ready to run through a wall, if you're not ready to go to the gym and create massive amounts of change or just get up and throw your running shoes on and go rip out a 520 mile, then there's majorly something wrong with you. Um, because today we've got the New York City Marathon 40 plus champion, uh, a guy that ran it in two hours and 33 minutes. He his best. He won London as well at 229. Um, it. it <laughs> And the mentality he shows up with in every aspect of his life is something to be renowned and truly reflected in every way possible. So I could not be more excited to welcome Ken Rideout to the Own It Show. Welcome to our couch. Thank you for being here. Thank you, man. When you were giving me all those praises, I was like, damn, who are they talking about? This guy sounds awesome. (laughs) Me. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god i don't think of myself that way but i i i i come to realize recently that people see that and uh i'm incredibly humbled and honored to be here and um yeah man you know it's like the old cliche is like the the, the easiest story to remember is the truth so when i'm speaking my truth i guess it's resonating with people but it's the only it's the only story i know you know what i mean it's like I don't know, extreme ownership is like, it seems so incredibly obvious to me that, yo, you're on your own, baby. There's no safety net. No one's coming to save you. And I think that, you know, I grew up in that type of environment, but my own children at times, I've got to give them a lot of tough love because I'm like, man, society in general was so used to protecting these kids and treating them like Fabergé eggs. It's like, we're, we're, we're so afraid of their feelings getting hurt. I'm like, dude, when you get into the real world, not only are people going to hurt your feelings, they're going to do it on purpose. Seems so foreign to my kids are like, why is that guy doing that to the other guy? I'm like, cause he's not a nice person. It's, it's such a foreign concept to some, to this like new age of kids and some, maybe even some millennials, but yeah. Anyway, sorry, that was a long-winded intro, but yeah, extreme ownership is like the story of my life, but it's just, I don't know, it's not a conscious concept I adhere to, it's just my reality. I, I want you to kind of dive into that a little bit, because I had the pleasure of obviously meeting you at uh, uh, Ryan Maza's uh, HPLT and uh, literally being around you for an entire day. And the way that you carried yourself, the way that you spoke, you obviously talked to us for uh, about an hour and a half and, and just hearing your story and where you grew up, how you came to generate this, this isn't so, this mentality you lead with isn't something you've always carried, but something that you learned and something that you had to come to. And so can you share with the audience a little bit what your process was or what your life story was like that ultimately brought you to this point where you had to make that switch and it changed that mentality for you to be who you are now? Yeah, I, I would say that my life in my, when I look in the rear view mirror, it was like a crash course in reality, but at this meaning, meaning, um, As a child, I was very uncomfortable in my surroundings. And for context, like the week after I graduated from high school, I started working as a guard in in a prison, a a prison that my stepdad had previously been in while I was in grade school, which was incredibly traumatizing to me. Although I had grown up around a lot of like bad people and ex-cons and drug addicts and, um, But, you know, when you're growing up in that environment as a child, that's your norm. You don't know anything different. So it wasn't like I didn't feel like, oh, my God, why is this happening to me? Because I just assumed everyone lived to a certain extent like that. But I never felt comfortable there. I always knew that there was people living a much more stable, comfortable life, not necessarily wealthy, but just like with peace and love in their house. And, And that didn't exist in my house. Um, you know, I was telling my kids the other day, 
I, I threaten them with a spanking all the time, but if they've gotten three amongst the four of them in their whole life, that would be a lot. Um, and, and, and as they were saying, they were asking me if I ever got a spanking. And I was like, you know something, I got a daily spanking with a belt every single day. But at the time, I didn't feel like I was being abused. But looking back now, obviously, it's maniacal, right? To hit a kid with a belt. I'm like, a hand doesn't hurt enough. You got to whack me with a belt. But all of that shit fueled me to get out of there. I don't know why or how, but I knew as a kid, I was like, what the fuck? How am I going to get out of here? I got to get out of here. So I applied to college. No one else had gone to college. No one told me how to do it. I did it myself. I applied for student loans. I just figured it out. I was never a great student, but I was, you know, average. But I, but I had a, I had a strong work ethic, but I was also a nice kid. Like I got along with the teachers. I was like friends with the principal. I, I just was friendly. And um, when I think that Really, I started to adopt this ownership mentality when I went to college. And that's when the first time I realized, like, holy shit, I'm on my own. I live here by myself. No one's coming to help me. I've got to buy books. No one has money for me to buy books. I got to figure out how to get books. It was just, I just remember I became jaded. I became like an ang angrier. And um, I was resentful of the fact that I was ill prepared for life. And even now when I think about it, yeah, I, I, that's exactly how I feel. Th these motherfuckers set me up for failure. They didn't give me any tools to succeed. I had to figure it out and I'm angry about it. it even now people will say, well, you worked in the prison, paid for your own school. Those were good experiences. You could take a lot from that. Yeah, yeah, I did and I do. But I'm still pissed off that I was like robbed of that like innocence of like being able to just go to school and like, live that life instead of being on the grind and working four to midnight at the prison while other kids were like studying and doing the damn things that kids do. But look, I, I kept myself busy. I played football and hockey in college, both like division three, you know, NCAA sports. And, you know, working in the prison gave, made me realize like, this is not the life I want, man. It wasn't even the inmates. It was the other guards I was around. I was like the first time working with real adults. You know, I've had, I had, I mean, dude, I had paper roll when I was in the fourth grade. Then I worked in the supermarket. I was always hustling and grinding because I wanted nice shit for myself and no one was giving me anything. So, um, you know, I, so, so, so when I was working in the prison, I realized, holy shit, if I, I was studying sociology, I was like, if I don't get my shit together, I'm going to be destined to work here forever. I might as well be in prison because this is the suckiest job in the history of jobs. And um, I mean, we could do a whole episode on um, just life in, in, in the prison and the, the stories and the things that happened to me in the prison. And I know it sounds like terrifying to people but when you grow up in that environment and I mean the first day I walked into prison a guy who I knew from the streets just comes running over and picked me up on his shoulder and is running around with me this big giant Irish gangster guy he was in prison for whacking someone in the head with a claw end of a hammer and he was basically like sending a signal to the other inmates like hey this guy's with us he's okay this kid is you know he's with us so the other inmates are like, all right, he, he, he knows people. That's just, that's prison. Like if you go to jail and you don't know people in there, you got problems. Like if you're not a street person and you go to jail, you got a problem because people are lying along racial lines there. And they, 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 I don't want to say they look out for each other, but you, you don't, races don't mix in prison. You're with your people and that's that. So anyway, uh, yeah, when I, that, that really lit a fire under my ass. And in the last couple of years I was in college, I started really studying. And as um, soon as I graduated, I moved to New York. Um, my very first job was a pharmaceutical sales job only for a few months because when I moved to New York and, and started going to the gym, I saw all these kids my age that were working in finance. And I was like, yo, these kids are making huge money. What, 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 this is crazy. I'm going to do this, which at the time... You know, if you told me before I moved to New York and had seen other kids working in finance, if you told me to go get a job in finance, it was the equivalent of telling me to go be an astronaut. I was like, how would I ever do? I wouldn't even know where to begin. But, you know, as fate would have it, one kid that I connected with was working on an institutional sales desk and they needed an intern and slash assistant and I and they hired me. Right. And, and, and next thing you know, I'm working in institutional finance and so began my journey and finance but that was that's how I got started that's I mean that's a snapshot of my life and my background in terms of um 
my my mentality but once i got into that finance role it it it, it very much became like a, a alpha type you know world of like you, that's that 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 world of sales and trading is dominated by alpha mentalities and um <laughs> I didn't like the person that I was when I was doing it, but I went into survival instinct and I just became like, yo, okay, if this is the battle of the alphas, then let's be the baddest motherfucker in here and be as aggressive as anyone. I, I hate the person that I was when I was doing that, but I did it. And I, and I, and for a long time, I like, I had success doing it. it like I said, I'm not like proud of the person that I was and the way I behaved because it was way, it just, it's 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 just a bad environment. I mean, credit to those who succeed in that long term in that sales and trading environment. But for me, it was just fast paced, too aggressive. I don't like being aggressive and intimidating with other people. But if I have to, like I said, I spent four years in a prison. I can get like I can get ugly if I have to. But I don't. Yeah, I don't. Definitely. Have to. I'd rather be. I'd rather be supportive and and like <laughs> treat people with respect. But anyway. Yeah, I don't want to get oh, down one down one area if you guys want to talk about other topics. No, I think I think it's um it's interesting. One of the things I really I really noticed about you and what you were saying is this almost this amazing instinctual mentality that you have because you talked about um this anger that you have. And it's interesting because when you were talking about how how your kids see somebody else being angry or approaching somebody in a negative, mean way, it's because they're a mean person. And, you know, but you didn't say this on the episode yet, but you said it in the pre-show, you said, nobody's coming to save me. I had to do this all on my own. And knowing what you went through and, and all of these, these really difficult situations that basically the world was against you, you could have turned into and become that mean person. But instead yes. it's clear you're using your anger to fuel you and to yes. be the best version of yourself. Tell me about that's that. Right. Dude, that's right. When I'm running races, I've said this in more, I've said this in every interview or every conversation I've ever had. When I'm running a race, there is no amount of suffering that equates to the emotional and physical suffering that I've been through and that I've seen other people go through. And I'm like, yo, we're just tired and 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 spent from a cardiovascular standpoint. This is nothing. This is not pain. This is not hard. This is just a little bit of physical suffering that I can see the end. I know at 26 miles, I'm done. So, and, and the feeling that I have when I'm, when I'm done with this is going to be awesome. So yeah, that's how I put that kind of physical suffering and pain into perspective is like, this is not real pain, real pain. You can't get away from is like, and, and real pain isn't even necessarily physical. It's that feeling of like helplessness. And that feeling of like dread and depression and feeling like, you know, one of the things that I didn't talk about at that, um, at that, at that HPLT, Brian Maza's event, the Brian, I love Brian Maza, by the way, in, in Austin was, they asked me what was a, what was one of my failures? What can I think of a failure? And I couldn't think of anyone, anything at the time, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that I couldn't remember, but this is, goes to, speaks to some of the work that I've done to try to get over this, but like, yeah, I had some huge failures. And one of them was when I was living in London in my late twenties and working in finance, I was like uh, addicted to drugs. I was taking opioids like every single day for like years on and off, on and off and struggling in silence with this, you know, as a functional addict and it was fucking torture. And, but even that is like nothing I've ever done from an endurance standpoint was as hard as withdrawing from opioids on my own in silence. And all I can, if, if, if anyone who's listened to this, who's ever had like a drug addiction to, to opioids or, you know, any of those kind of physical withdrawal symptoms will understand this, but I can't think of a worse hell than to go through withdrawal withdrawals on your own and suffer in silence and just like white knuckle it and just like and dude any addict will tell you that <laughs> inevitably addicts go through this on a fairly regular basis because 
your brain is like, okay, enough. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm getting off this. Okay, I'm going to buckle down a week. I'll be clean. Then you get a month or two under your belt. Then you get lazy and then you take some more and that slowly progresses into like, oh, fuck, I did it again. I'm doing this every day. Now I've got to go through another week of hell. And all I can tell you is imagine being as sick as you've ever been and you know it can go away in one second if you just take another, like take some more. And and it's not like if I just get to seven days, I'm good. No, 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 no. At seven days, you're not like, you don't think you're going to die and you're not suicidal, but you still feel like shit for another two or three weeks. It's just like this. I mean, it's literally the worst drugs in the world, but that's part of my journey. Those are the things that that's who I am. I like that. Anytime someone, I see someone who's doing drugs or having problems in their life, that's like, that's a symptom of the problem. That's not the problem. My problem wasn't drugs. My problem was what was I trying to escape? I was trying to escape the pain and the, the, the anger for, even though it doesn't seem rational to me at the, as I say this, I know that that, that, that that pain and that damage still lingers from my childhood of like, this is up to me to deal with this. And while I, it's easy for me to say like, oh, it is what it is. I, I dealt with it. That, that pain is still there. And when I found these drugs, it basically made that pain go away. You know, they call them painkillers because they numb physical pain, but they numb all emotional pain, good and bad. Mm -hmm. So you don't have those, your brain gets reprogrammed to not appreciate the little pleasures in life. Those get dull. You're giving your brain a false sense of happiness every time you take more pills or shoot more heroin, whatever your drug of choice is. I never did heroin, but um, when you take Percocet or, or Fentanyl, or whatever it is, you're giving your brain an artificial reward that it's not used to. So when, when you get a true reward, like a good meal or uh, a, a emotional high from seeing someone, everything becomes dulled. And that was like, that is, is the biggest failure of my life. Like when I think about that, and then that, 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 that then comes the self-loathing and self-hatred for like, how fucking dare you do this to yourself? Like you're your own best friend and your own worst enemy. And, you know, I think that, you know, to not mention this stuff would be a um, disservice to anyone listening to this to think like, wow, this guy's doing everything. No, I'm not. That's why I'm so humbled when people want to talk to me because I'm not great. I'm not. I'm, I'm just a fucking dude trying to get by. I've had some wins and I've had a lot of losses. And this is, you know, part of talking about this is like my own therapy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And um, thank you for the vulnerability because that's what makes this podcast great is people like you being able to come and be their true selves. And, and this will probably be one of the, the most listened to podcasts because you are showing up in the way that you're showing up. And, you know, I, I think it's amazing to not only see the vulnerability, but it's clear, Ken, that you've done so much work. Somebody who hasn't doesn't speak like this. They don't, they don't have the awareness. They don't know what, what, where the pain was coming from. They haven't delved into and, and dusted off basically all the trauma they experienced their entire life. So thank you. Genuinely. Thank you for the, the vulnerability. What I'm curious to know is, um, what did it for you? Like, where did the shift happen and where did it come from? Um, when I, when, when I started to think of when we started to have kids and look, I've, I've not always, no one is perfect, right? Like I, I, I did a lot of work to get sober and, you know, I've had plenty of missteps over the years, but I would say that everything good in my life has come from endurance sports and it's given me an outlet to kind of burn off that energy where that's my high every day. When I get up, I run every single day. And you know, people are like, oh, every day, yeah, cool. Well, like six days, fucking every day, 365, every day. The only days that I've missed in the last few years have been like, if I had a morning flight and it was so long that when I landed somewhere, it was like eight o'clock at night. Like, I mean, I'm not a maniac. I'm not gonna like go out and, go out and run at midnight just to prove a point, you know, it has to be, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's reason. It has to be reasonable. I don't like missing days, but that's my drug that like gets me 
that gets me going. That's my first thing. And if I'm feeling shit in the end of the day, like when you just called me and reminded me that I'm late for the interview, I was lifting weights in the, in my basement because I'm like, that's my, that's my like reward system. Like, Oh, I'm not feeling that good. I know what I need to do. Like I need to move. Um, but yeah, when I, when I, when I started thinking about having kids and being an example for my kids, I was like, dude, this is the, Again, no one would even know this. I've never spoken about this at this at length or in depth like this, which is why I get a little bit emotional just reflecting back on like how much time I wasted and, and all the things that I should have done differently. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of part of what fuels me is like, I don't want to waste any more time. I need to get the most out of every single day because I pissed away a lot of them and we don't have forever here. You know what I mean? This is a one-time trip through. It's like we're in a gigantic amusement park and some people are content to just ride the merry-go-round and be like, yeah, yeah, I'm cool right here. Don't get, I don't even want to wait in line. I just want to stay here. And <laughs> other people are like, I need to try everything three times and then I'll decide where I want to focus my attention. That's kind of how I feel is like, I just, I want to try everything. I, I don't want to miss anything. And I spent time over here on this ride and that was not doing it for me. It, like, that's like, you know, that was not the way I want to live. And um, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to get off on a tangent about uh, my failures. I know this is about owning it and winning, but I think it's important that people recognize and acknowledge not only their losses, but why did I lose? you know, it's part of like the debrief, like, like after a football game, watching the film, like, okay, what did we do wrong there? It wasn't what, it wasn't, I did this, but why did I do it? And I realized there were things missing in my life. And part of that was a, in, in high school, like I said, I was like a nice kid. I had a sense of accomplishment. I knew who I was. I was like the quarterback of the football team. I was proud of myself. Then I went to college and I was like fucking lost at sea. I was just, I had it's crazy to think I'm not an excuse maker, but I can see in hindsight that I was just completely lost. I had no guidance. I had no one. And, and listen, I'm not making excuses. I don't need anyone to turn to. It's up to me to figure out the bottom line is I didn't, but I didn't have anyone to turn to like help me through trials and tribulations of being an adult. And all of a sudden I'm an adult with no adults in my life. I didn't, my parents had me when they were 19 and 20. They were like inner city kids. They, they, they just didn't have the skill sets. But like I said, I'm not making excuses for them. I'm still pissed off, but it is what it is. That, that's, that was my reality. And I just didn't have the tools at that age to be able to deal with it. And as a result, when I think back about my time in college, they're not good memories. Cause I'm like, I was a horrible version of myself. Cause I hadn't figured out what I needed to figure out. And to be honest with you, only in my late forties. And even now I feel like this is the best year of my life. Like, I feel like I'm getting better as I go. Cause I have more experience and I'm taking advantage of the things that are available to me. And I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm just living, you know, like I'm living my best life, not to sound cliche, but that's how I view it. It's like, I just want to do it. I, I don't want to fucking sit around watching other people do shit. I don't want to be looking on Instagram and, and, and be green with envy. I love Instagram because it allows me to keep in touch with people and I see what my friends are doing and I like it. I never have those feelings of, that some people have of jealousy. But this took a long time to get to this point where I feel like genuinely supportive of other people. And I feel like collectively by building this kind of network like Brian Mazza has with HPLT is like you're bringing together like-minded people that all have their own shit going on but everyone here is genuinely trying to support each other and lift each other up what you know like i want to if we're having a competition yeah i want to win i want to like step on your throat i'm like mike tyson i want to eat your kids i want to take you <laughs> but as soon as we're done i want to like lift you up and be like i'd be doing you a disservice if i didn't go for your throat when i had the chance <laughs> you know what i mean it's like how are you going to get better if i don't push you every step of the way if we're competing completely and I, I, I resonate with that so heavily being an athlete and uh, being an ex-professional athlete and then now coming into what I do today. And I, I, I want to preface by like a lot, like never apologize for, for diving into that because you speaking that today, speaking that truth, leaning into it, it resonated with somebody. And it, ownership doesn't exist without failure. 100%. 
you cannot live in ownership unless you look back on where you've been and ultimately it allows you to go forward and be like you said that game film that allows you to learn there's only wins and learning experiences that's it that's right because that's as what we, I always tell. We, we don't lose we just learn if you think you lose and and, and it's been I try to convey that to my children and it's interesting watching children because their, their brains just aren't developed. Right. So like they do things and I'm like, why are you doing that? And then I'm like, cause he's five. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's exactly right. And when you look back on these experiences and you start to be able to understand, Oh, okay. I understand where I went wrong there. I understand how I can start to change. And then you start to develop the mentality and lead with the mentality of what, you're speaking with here is I'm not going to fail. The failure is not in my, it's not, what am I trying to say here? Think about this in the concept of if you approach life, knowing that you can't fail, failure does not exist. I might learn something along the way, but I'm going to step back up and take another swing at the can. How freeing is that? <laughs> I feel free as a motherfucker. <laughs> like, uh, and, and I bring this into like your runs, like, and you touched on this in your, in your talk to us was like 230, 229, 233, like regularly running 26 miles in that time is absolutely incredible. And a lot of people will be like, well, I can never get there. Well, yes, you cannot because you've never tried. That's exactly right. I didn't set out to try to win a marathon. I set out to run 10 miles and see if I could do it. Then when I did it, I started doing it regularly. Then I saw the Ironman on TV in Hawaii. And I was like, that's impossible. And I caught myself being like, that's impossible. There's fucking 2000 people doing that. What kind of pussy are you like toughen up? And I just was like, yo, I'm going to do that. And two years later, I did it. And then I did it three times in total. And, uh, as, you know, that started the real endurance journey. And, 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 and while I was doing the triathlon training, I started to notice I was getting faster at running. And then I slowly transitioned over the last like three or four years into pure running. But even the running, I was like, my first objective when I really focused on running was, let me see if I can run a marathon under three hours. That wasn't long ago. It might have been in like 13 or 14. And then I said, huh, I wonder if I could like get to 245, which seems crazy to think you could run 15 minutes faster when it took me years to get under 230. But I'll tell you that I have a really good friend called Mark Kuchinat who was in the same boat. He ran at Harvard. He's a few years younger than me. I think he's 47. It took this guy like seven years of me knowing him to get under three hours. He's a very good runner. From the time he ran under three hours, like a year or two years ago, he just ran... 245 at Sacramento and and six weeks before that he ran his best time 251 in Chicago I'm like dude you just took six minutes off your PR I remember like praying to God that you could find 10 seconds to get under three hours like a few years ago mm -hmm. but the point is it's like it's same thing with like addiction is if you think about how am I going to live the next 10 years when you've only been a drug addict for 10 years how am I going to get through the next 10 you that is that's why they say in AA, one day at a time, just take one step at a time. If you try to go out and say, I'm going to win a marathon. Yes, it sounds fucking crazy. But if you just go out and say, I'm going to run 10 miles a day and see how long I can make it. Okay, that might be aggressive. You might not be able to do that out the gate. But someone was asking me, how did you, how did you improve? Does it make sense? You, I, Cause I went from, I would say I went from 258 to 233 in like two or three years. And they said, what did you do? I said, all I did was run a minimum of 10 miles every day. And I did one long run on Saturday or Sunday. When I did the long run, I tried to run as fast as I could for like 20 miles. I progress into it. So I wasn't on a suicide mission. I'd had some, some concept of how to train, but I never had a coach. And when I got to 233, I started working with a coach called Mario Freoli, who, who, who has a podcast called The Morning Shakeout. That's a really popular running podcast. He started coaching me and I went from 233 to, while I was at 233, I was like, all right, I'm definitely getting under 230. The next race was 234. The next race was 235. I was like, God damn it. It's so far to run to come up so short because you can't do it every week. You know, yeah. you need a few months to really like get ready again. And um, yeah, he started training me for 12 weeks. 
I was actually training the light heavyweight champion of the world, uh, Alex Vosdick, for a boxing match, a huge title unification fight. I was Teddy Atlas's assistant trainer. We lived for eight weeks in Philadelphia in training camp, and I used it as my own training camp, and I ran like 80 to 100 miles a week for 12 weeks. And then after I came out of that, I had four weeks back in Cali running in the trails, and I went to Sacramento in December of 2019. I ran 228, and uh, man, I was pumped. But... I was like, all right, what's the ne what's next? Can I go? Can I run two twenty six? And that was that. That was it. I know. I know. I'm not trying to diminish anyone's accomplishments, but I'm like, no one's gonna punch you in the face. No one's gonna choke you unconscious. You don't need anything fancy. All you need is running shoes and an ounce of determination, and you can do this. So when people ask me, what did you do? I said I ran ten miles a day for three or four years. Then I started adding in workouts. Mm -hmm. Then I started I adding structure. And can you tell the listeners what your very first marathon time was? Um, I ran a 320 marathon without knowing what I was doing in like gym shorts and cotton t-shirt in like 1997 with no running experience at all. I mean, 320 is respectable, but it's not like... Mm. You cut an hour off. No yeah. big deal. You cut an hour <laughs> off. <laughs> and but so then after that, I ran two or three in like 330. You know, like I was still trying, but I was like, you know, so yeah. 320 and 330. So yeah, it took an hour off of like my average time. <laughs> yeah. And so you said something that just like hit me in the face where you were like, I didn't set, set out to win a marathon. That's not what I set out to do, but I took iterative steps and truly owned my process and allowed me to get there. Now, what if, again, we went and took this aspect into our life and we were like, I, I'm not setting out to change the world. I'm not setting out to, um, uh, get a big massive house on Malibu. But by changing my mentality and focusing in on the iterative process of what's going to create that at the end of the day, knowing that you're going to take some swings and just wind up missing, that's okay because it's a part of your journey to get to where you're going to be. And if you're leading with that way that you can't fail, guess what? That's a scary person to play against. That's right. A person uh, that can't think... lose is a scary person to play against. There's nothing scarier than the man with nothing to lose. When you have a negotiation, the guy who cares less wins every time. A hundred percent. I, I, and, I absolutely you know, love that. If you're, like you said, if you're afraid to lose, the same for you, find something else. Maybe like try a different profession. But this is, I was telling my kids last night something about losing. And I said, listen, my, one of my kids hates to lose, but to an irrational point where I'm like, dude, cut this shit with the source board stuff. Like enough is enough. I'm like, you better get used to losing, dude, because you lose a lot more than you win in life. And it's not about how many times you lose. It's how many times you get up and keep trying. If you're not going to try, I got no time for that. The only rule in our house with sports, you don't have to be good. You, you can be terrible, but you cannot have a shit effort. You have to try your best. You have to go 110% every time. Otherwise, that's unacceptable. I don't care if you strike out every time, but run up to the plate, run back to the dugout. I don't care if you're crying, run back to the dugout and cry, but that's fine. But don't not, don't be lazy. Um, <laughs> but anyway. it, and it's, it can be applied to life in so many different ways. And that's, I think the biggest part that I love about this is that it's not just about running. It's just not about uh, business. It's just not about entrepreneurship, but it's about life. And it's these things that we take into consideration is that you lead in a way that you're able to show up and come up with a mentality, show up every single day, put in the effort. And guess what? You're going to lose more than you're going to win. But if you take those losses as learning experiences and come back again with that same ammo, you're going to get a lot closer next time around. Yeah. And it's, yeah. A, it's about a lot more than, um, you know, just having the awareness that you're going to lose and you're going to fail. I mean, true ownership is being able to look at all that and being able to improve upon it and being able to say, you know what, you said it earlier, you're learning, you're not losing, you're learning. And that is the definition of being able to live in ownership. So Ken, I want to ask you our listeners favorite question. What to you, somebody who has clearly mastered ownership, what to you would you say is your definition of ownership? 
It's uh, personal accountability and dependability. I tell people all the time, dude, just be dependable, man, at a minimum. And that might be just to yourself. Be dependable, commit to something, take ownership of it and show up every day. Do anything like you do. do every, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. If you're going to do it, show up and kick ass. Make yourself proud. Even when no one's watching, make yourself proud. No one gave a shit if I ran 10 miles every day. It wasn't my goal to get attention or to win races. My goal was to be a better person and hold myself accountable. And, you know, some days it was a form of self-punishment. Other days it was a reward. Other days it was my way to get high. But the bottom line is it got done. And I don't give a shit what story you have to tell yourself because it's all stories. It's all stories. Everything that happens in your life is your own story. It's your interpretation of what happened. Someone said X, Y, Z to you. <clears throat> you interpreted it the way you interpreted it. It's the story. It's all, it's all how you see the world and how you tell the, convey that story to your brain. And, and I tell people, you have two people that live in your brain, an alpha and a beta. And when it's raining and it's cold and the beta is like, oh shit, dude, we don't want to run. It's too cold out here. And then you have the, the alpha that's like, oh, like the Animal House movie, like, oh, we don't want to go with you, Bluto. We might get in trouble. Like, F you, we're running. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that dialogue goes on all the time. And a lot of times in people that don't do shit or are afraid, the beta is taken over and it's like, dude, don't do it. Protect yourself. Guard against danger. Like, no. Like, like you said, if you couldn't fail, why would you do anything? I wouldn't go and run. I wouldn't want to run a race if I knew I was going to win. Like, I mean, come on. When I was in the Palisades, I won the turkey trot, like, you know, a few years in a row. It got to the point where I said to my wife, like, I feel almost like an idiot now. I'm like the bull who's coming down here and beating like the weekend warriors. Like I should let, I should not go, like go support other people and let someone else have a win. But then there's a part of me that's like, would I be doing them a favor if I didn't show up? Why should I let someone win? Like raise your game, dude, let's go. You know, I'm here taking over this neighborhood. This is my race. So I go back and forth between like the like the competitor and the nice guy was like, oh, let's someone else win. No, you will not do anyone a favor by giving them a free pass. So anyway, that to me is extreme ownership is like, be proud of yourself, be dependable, show up. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. Even if you're the only person watching, make yourself proud, be proud of yourself. It, it takes a lot of work to get to that point. And I always, and I haven't always been proud of myself. There's a lot of things I'm not proud of, but today, I feel proud of myself and look how lucky I am. Somebody actually wants to talk to me and hear about my story. Like I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And guys, if you're not jacked up, ready to run through a wall, ready to grab your shoes and just start your journey somewhere to level yourself up and truly, truly start living your life in ownership. I don't know what is going to get you going. And you can get access to this guy every single day. I know I've just loved every single thing he's been posting the other day you look at typical runners the cross-country runners their skin their or their their skin they're thin they're skinny and this guy's got his muscles pumping he's got his shirt off all jacked up I in the he gym might even be bigger than you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this guy's running a 223 230 mile or a 230 marathon like they don't look this way and so there's stuff you can learn. Ken, where can people interact with you? Where can they find you? Where can they um, see more of your content and what you're putting out there? Uh, I put everything on Instagram and Strava. If you just search my name, I think you find me. Um, I just want to say the picture I put on Instagram, lifting weights, that was one of like 10,000 pictures I took. I was like, oh shit, look at the angle on this picture. I actually look like I have muscles. And people <laughs> were like, Holy shit, dude, you got muscle. Dude, I weigh 165 pounds right now. I'm 5'10". I, the picture just made me look, it was a good picture. I have my my six-year-old son down there. I'm like, buddy, take a picture of me like this. Try this. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a maniac. But thank you for noticing. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys for having me on. I hope people enjoyed it. Um, like, yeah, like you said, I'm super accessible on Instagram. I try to respond to everyone that's reasonable. Sometimes people ask me unreasonable, crazy shit. But <laughs> if you're reasonable, like, hey, I'm happy to know you. And I'm honored that anyone would care to even want to talk to me. Guys, it's so clear that 
no matter what your background is, no matter what your story is, you can succeed. And it's about having that mentality that I am going to do it. Failure is not an option. Failure does not exist as long as you show up to the plate and take a swing. And sometimes you're going to miss. And that's okay. It's okay to fail because failures aren't real. All they are is learning experiences. As long as we take something and get back up again. If you take a look at it. Can I give you one last story uh, along those lines when you said like, um, what you just said kind of resonated with me, reminding me of something like everything is available to us here. We live in the greatest country on earth. I, my, we adopted my daughter from Ethiopia. She's 11 now. We adopt her as a newborn. And when people ask like, what was the inspiration to adopt? Given my background and my, my, my childhood, I always knew I wanted to like give back and, and change someone else's life. And um, <laughs> I'm going to try not to get emotional. Mm-hmm. And um I told my wife right from the, when I first met her, I wanted to adopt kids, but I didn't want to, I, I wanted to adopt kids where I could make the most difference. And like you just said, you, everything's, like I just said, everything's available to us here. If you're born in this country, you're good. I'm an example of that. Everything was stacked against me. My brother, who was 11 months younger, grew up in the same circumstances, has been in and out of prison his whole life. He's never had a real job. He's, like, he's a product of the environment. Mm-hmm. And, um, But the point is, if you're born there and you have the determination and the willpower and you're born in this country, you can do anything you want. If you're born into a third world country, especially into an orphanage, you might not even survive. And that was, I just, uh, it was, I felt that it was my responsibility to do something to help someone else. And uh, so we adopted my daughter and then we had three boys and we've been trying to adopt another one, but it's the adoption industry is the shadiest business on earth. But nevertheless, adopting my daughter is like, one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me and you know people will say naively sometimes oh what you did for her is great I'm like what I did for her maybe I'm the selfish one maybe I did something for myself maybe it was self-serving for me to adopt her to give myself some purpose and and give myself a reason to be motivated and 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 be the best person I can be and give her an example of what hard work and 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 not just hard work this isn't just about hard work and winning races and all this physical bullshit it's about setting an example emotionally and spiritually and being a good person and trying to provide a loving peaceful house because ultimately that's what we all want as just peace of mind nothing else like we just want to be calm and peaceful in our mind whatever that looks like yes you need to be healthy and fit to be peaceful you need a certain amount of like creature comforts in your life yes but it's all chasing inner peace so anyway i digress but the point is you if you're in this country and you're listening to this and speak in english like you have a huge advantage over a lot of people in the world that 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 don't have access to what you have and what we have take advantage of it dude it's free it's free for everyone Fucking let's go <laughs> <laughs> and go and drive it and and ultimately lead to win at the end of the day because remember guys success is different own you're different we'll see you next week